Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Over here in the West Sound Room, West Sound Public Library. And those of you around the world who are watching today, I assume. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that we are gathered on the turf of the traditional ancestral indigenous. Unseen land of the Kandigaika Mohawk Nation and of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, to whom we are very grateful. We recognize their first made research nation as the guardians and custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Before I begin, I think what I would also like to do is to acknowledge the people who will be doing the readings, rather than have them jump up and down every time they say the name. So I'm going to read you their biography, and when they come up to read, they'll say who they are, and so you'll know exactly who's who. And they'll also tell you which parts they'll be reading. First person on my list and is not necessarily in any terrible alphabetical order. It's called the Colonel. Her many plays and novels include Cakewalk, Something Drastic, Six Hearts, Ireland's Own, Carmel O'Reilly, Tonight, and True True Nature, which is two years at Central Theater. Her uh, comedy, The Go at the Coconut Grove, had a one night only world premiere. Sarah Blooms and Montreal two years ago. You can watch her triple threat talents, writer, actor, puppet master, in a very short short, Blooms Day, which she considers to be a YouTube sensation. <laughs> Holly's newest novel, After Stars, made 10 best on the long list for the scene, Lee Pop Medal for Humor. She spent the last two years writing Kitty Colony. Which stars Deborah Hale and Lorna Wilson. It was voted Best Canadian Web Series by Now Magazine. Another Peggy. Peggy is an award winning journalist whose career at the Gazette included stints as City Columns, Ottawa Correspondent, TV Critic, Universities Reporter, Feature Writer, Political and City Editor. She has trailed after the Pope. Curtsy to the Queen and Stop the Hell's Angels, probe the inner workings of the brain, and examine the lingering impact of tragedies in the Latin Nazi and the death. Her first short play, the, That Night at Mrs. Challenge, is included in picturesque Voices of Me for All, which premiered at the Guild's Red Path Museum. She is also an accomplished mosaic. And collage artist. Her favorite work by James Joyce is Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Another collaborator is Sylvia Simbolista, who's an artist, painter, living in the Netherlands. She also explores more theatrical engagements. She has participated in many plays directed by Paul Holman. John Donahue. Was a professor of English literature at Champlain College in St. Lambert. As well, he has been a member of various Irish groups, including the Canadian Association of Irish Studies, the North American Association of Public Language Teachers, and Montreal's Mohawk Group. Over the years, Suzanne, Susan Gilmore, whose deep roots are in Dublin and Mayo, has been involved in a number of community productions, including variety shows, stage plays, radio plays, and dramatic readings. She has performed with the Montreal Blues Day Group since its inception, outdoors at McGill University in uh, 2011. The global 
Globe State reading of Ulysses in 2013 was a highlight, bringing together the world and a reading of the complete text. Being a part of the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the publication of Ulysses to her was a joy. When Pat Nation decided to move from teaching in an elementary school to teaching in a high school, the principal of the latter asked the principal of the former what she should teach. Oh, she should teach English. She loves to read out loud. And that is how Pat got to be a high school English teacher. <laughs> she still likes to read out loud and hear out today. <laughs> Liam Philip Cox was born in Pompano, County Tipperary, during World War II. Like Joyce, he was schooled unsparingly in a Jesuit college from the age of seven, followed by university and 49 more years in the classroom as a teacher. The last four decades, he has dwelt in Parc saint marie where he is currently the senior resident. Ellen Rubin has been an actor with Westmount Community Theatre Dramatis Persona for over 15 years and has participated in numerous short images and larger short summary pieces and larger twice yearly pieces under twice yearly pieces of voracious readers and enjoys voracious readers' genres and enjoys she has been also been writing short stories and hopes to see herself also been writing short stories. And hopes that the next production by Dramatis Persona will be done. Next Thomas. production by Dramatis Persona and it will be done twice in the fall. Under no tour. So, having said that, good morning, ladies. So, and having said that, good morning, ladies. Yeah. Gather today in West Country. Gather today in West Country and the rest of the world. I would like to thank. I would like to thank Public West Front Public Library for the generous support that they have given us today, Montreal, Montreal, since Chapter Chapter Eleven years ago. In particular, I would like, like to acknowledge Julianne Cargo, Donna Locke, and Daniel Dix for the special efforts to allow today's readings to occur before a, and I emphasize this before a live audience. There will be a one hour break for lunch after the reading of Hades. You can have lunch, return from 135 for the rest of the readings. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the publication of Ulysses, which been referred to often been referred as the most dangerous, most dangerous book. Kevin Birmingham, Kevin Birmingham, that's the best stuff of his time is that title. The Battle of for Ulysses is the most dangerous book. If you like to see the discussion of Ulysses, you can visit our website, bloomsdaymontreal.com, to see an extended interview that he gave Ben Strudo on February 2nd of this year. James Joyce's birthday and the publication date of Ulysses. James Joyce had this thing about his birthday and publications. Everything that he wrote was published on February 7th. A theme for this year's festival has been ripples, the ripple effect. Joyce's Ulysses had an enormous ripple effect on writing as well as other arts. The ripples are still being felt today. Instead of writing a story with the plot running in a straight line from beginning to end, he chose rather to have his characters <laughs> wander, meander through the streets of Dublin, meeting all kinds of ordinary people, doing everyday kinds of things. He even lets us listen in to the most private and intimate thoughts going through the characters' minds and allow us to see things that never before were shown in the standard novels of the past. If you've ever watched soap operas or seen films, you can say that it's thanks to James Joyce that not everything runs according to the timeline cast in stone. The action jumps from scene to scene back again. Thus, Wolfe even decided that certain events, because they are integral to the telling of the story, were admissible. And this freed authors from the clutches of the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. When I spoke to Ingram McBride, who was visiting Montreal a few years ago, 
I mentioned that I was the leader of the local Finnegan Wake reading group. <laughs> she told me that she had read Finnegan's Wake just before starting to write A Girl is a Half Born Thing. You get to see what a girl is a half born thing looks like. There's lots of rivers. If you've ever seen the crime series Professor T featuring a fictional forensic scientist professor at Cambridge University, you must acknowledge the influence of Jimmy Joyce as well. When soap bubbles mysteriously appear floating in the air, or when dancing girls emerge from the walls and the halls of the Senate institution, we see what's going on inside the mind. Thus, that you see what's going on inside the minds. See, you more than anybody else in this world. These are manifestations of Professor T's stream of consciousness and seems to be straight out of the essence of the existence. The story of this ordinary people begins on June 16, 1904, early in the morning. This day immortalizes the day James Joyce first locked out his future wife. Nora Barnwood. Like, like the river of Barnwood, she sat with him for the rest of his life. The location, the location is San Diego, just south of Dunga, in one, one of the more towns, towns guarding the coast of Ireland. The British are still in control, and the towns are a remnant of the time they fear Napoleon in the Holy Island. In 1904, this 1904 has been rented by Buck Mulligan, Stephen Dedalus, and Haynes, an English student of anthropology who has come over to study the natives. Buck Mulligan is a medical student who seems to be a frenemy, to use that word, Buck Mulligan, is a frenemy of Stephen. His character is based on a real life person, Oliver St. John Bogery. In the 18th century, according to Ulrich O'Connor, was a tradition of bucks, fire eaters, and shams who flourished side by side with the passionate oratory and patriotic spirit of the Anglo Irish Parliament in College Green. The legend lived on in the novels of Charles Lieber and the street ballads that recounted their feats and escapades. Joyce saw Bogarty as a descendant of the bucks, a primrose vested gallant against the picaresque society of lower middle class. Stephen is an unsuccessful medical student who has returned to Dublin because his mother has died. The time is 8 a.m. Mulligan is on the parapet of the tower where he, when the action begins. Mulligan is read by the Indian Fox. Stephen is read by Peggy Kerr. The narrator is John Donoghue. And I will play the voice of Haynes. Ladies and gentlemen, Telemachus. Stately, plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead, bearing a bowl of lather on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing gown on girdle was sustained gently behind him by the mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft and intoned. Into the evil and the hurry day. Halted, he peered down the dark winding stairs and called up coarsely. Come up, come up, Kinch, you fearful Jesuit. Silence all. He peered sideways up and gave a long, low whistle of call, then paused a while in rapt attention, his even white teeth glistening here and there with gold points. Chrysostomus. Two strong, shrill whistles answered through the calm. Thanks, old chap, he, cr he cried briskly. That'll do nicely. Switch off the current, will you? He skipped off the gun rest and looked gravely at his watcher, 
gathering about his legs, the loose folds of his gown. The plump shadowed face and sullen oval jow recall the prelate, patron of the arts in the Middle Ages. A pleasant smile broke quietly over his lips. A mockery of it, he said gaily. You're an absurd name, an ancient Greek. He pointed his finger in friendly jests and went over to the parapet, laughing to himself. Stephen Dedlis stepped up, followed him wearily halfway and sat down on the edge of the gun rest, watching him still as he propped his mirror on the parapet, dipped the brush in the bowl and lathered cheeks and neck. Buck Mulligan's gay voice went on. My name is absurd too, Malachi Mulligan, two dactyls. But it has a Hellenic ring to it, hasn't it? Tripping and sunning, like the book himself. We must go to Athens. Will you come if I can get the ant to fork out 20 quid? He laid the brush aside and, laughing with delight, cried. <laughs> Will he come? That's your June Jesuit. Ceasing, he began to shave with care. Tell me, Mulligan. Stephen said quietly. Yes, my love. How long is Haynes going to stay in the tower? Buck Mulligan showed a shaven cheek over his right shoulder. God, isn't he dreadful? He said frankly. A ponderous Saxon. He thinks you're not a gentleman. Godly, bloody English. Bursting with money and indigestion. Because he comes from Oxford. You know, Dedalus, you have the real Oxford manner. He can't make you out. Oh, my name for you is the best. Pinch the knife blade. He shaved warily over his chin. He was raving all night about the Black Panther, Stephen said. Where is his gun case? A woeful lunatic, Mulligan said. Were you in a funk? I was. Stephen said with energy and growing fear. Out there in the dark with a man I don't know, raving and moaning to himself about shooting a panther. You save men from drowning. I'm not a hero, however. If he stays on here, I am off. Buck Mulligan frowned at the lather on his razor blade. He hopped down from his perch and began to search his trouser pockets hastily. Scutter! He cried thickly. He came over to the gun rest and thrusting a hand into Stephen's upper pocket said, Lend us a loan of your nose rag to wipe my razor. Stephen suffered him to pull out and hold up on show by its corner a dirty, crumpled handkerchief. Buck Mulligan wiped the razor blade neatly. Then, gazing over the handkerchief, said, The Bob's nose rag. A new art color for our Irish poets. It's not green. You can almost taste it, can't you? He mounted to the parapet again and gazed out over Dublin Bay, his fair oak pale hair stirring slightly. God, he said quietly. Isn't the sea what algae calls it? A great, sweet mother. The snot green sea, the scrotum tightening sea, epioina papontum. Ah, Daedalus, the Greeks, I must teach you. You must read them in the original. Salata, Salata. She is our great sweet mother. Come and look. Stephen stood up and went over to the parapet. Leaning on it, he looked down on the water and on the mail boat clearing the harbor mouth of Kingstown. Our mighty mother, Buck Mulligan said. He turned abruptly, his great searching eyes from the sea to Stephen's face. The ant thinks you killed your mother, he said. That's why she won't let me have anything to do with you. Someone killed her, Stephen said gloomily. You could have knelt down, damn it, Pinch, when your dying mother asked you. Buck Mulligan said. I, I'm as much as you. But to think of your mother begging you with her last breath to kneel down and pray for her, and you refused. There's something sinister in you. He broke off and lathered again lightly his farther cheek. A tolerant smile curled his lips. But a lovely mummer, he, he murmured to himself. Kinch, the loveliest mummer of them all. He shaved evenly and with care, in silence, seriously. Stephen, an elbow rested on the jagged granite, leaned his palm against his brow and gazed at the fraying edge of his shiny black coat sleeve. Pain that was not yet the pain of love fretted his heart. 
Silently in a dream, she had come to him after her death, her wasted body within its loose brown grave clothes, giving off an odor of wax and rosewood. Her breath that had bent upon him, mute, reproachful, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Across the threadbare cuff edge, he saw the sea, hailed as a great sweet mother by the well-fed voice beside him. The ring of bay and skyline had a dull green mass of liquid. A bowl of white china had stood beside her deathbed, holding the green sluggish bile which she had torn up from her rotting liver by fits of loud groaning vomiting. Buck Mulligan wiped again his razor blade. Ah, poor girl, buddy. He said in a kind voice. I must give you a shirt and a few known facts. How are the second-hand Greeks? He fit well enough. Buck Mulligan attacked the hollow beneath his underwear. The lock of it, I must be said to the second leg, it should be. God knows what upsy bouncy devil lock. I have a lovely pair with a hair stripe, grey. You look stiff in them. I'm not joking, Tim. You look damn well when you're dressed. Thanks, Stephen said. I can't wear them if they're grey. Oh, you can't wear them. Buck Mulligan told his face in the mirror. Etchy-tetchy is an etchy He kills his mother, but he can't wear a great <laughs> He folded his razor neatly and with stroking palps of fingers felt the smooth skin. Stephen turned his gaze from the sea and to the plump face with its smoke-blue mobile eyes. That fellow I was with in the ship last night, said Buck Mulligan, says you have GPI. He's up in Dottyville with Connolly Norman. General paralysis of the insane. He swept the mirror a half circle in the air to flash the tidings of broad in sunlight, now radiant on the sea. His curling shaven lips laughed, and the edges of his white glittering teeth, laughter seized all his strong trunk well knit. Look at you, said. You a dreadful bar. Stephen bent forward and peered at the mirror held out to him cleft by a crooked crack, hair on end. I see others see me. Who chose this face for me? The dog's body to rid of vermin. It asks me to. It pinched it out of the skivvy's room, Buck Mulligan said. It does her all right. The aunt always keeps playing looking servants for Malachy. Lead him not into temptation, and her name is Ursula. Laughing again, he brought the mirror away from Stephen's peering eyes. The rage of Caliban at not seeing his face in a mirror, he said, if Wilde were only alive to see you. Drawing back and pointing, Stephen said with bitterness, It is a symbol of Irish art, the cracked looking glass of a servant. Buck Mulligan suddenly linked his arm in Stephen's and walked with him round the tower, his razor and mirror clacking in the pocket where he had thrust them. It's not fair to tease you like that change, is it? He said kindly. God knows you have more spirit than any of them. To ourselves, new paganism, um for us. Let him stay, Stephen said. There's nothing wrong with him except at night. Then what is it? Mulligan, Buck Mulligan asked impatiently. Buff it up, I, I'm quite frank with you. What have you against me now? They halted, looking towards the blunt bay of Bray Head that lay on the water, like the snout of a sleeping whale. Stephen freed his arm quietly. You wish me to tell you? He asked. Yes, what is it? Buck Mulligan answered. I, I don't remember anything. He looked in Stephen's face as he spoke. A light wind passed his brow, fanning softly his fair uncombed hair and stirring silver points of anxiety in his eyes. Stephen, depressed by his own voice, said, You remember the first day I went to your house after my mother's death? Buck Mulligan frowned quickly and said, What? Where? I, I can't remember anything. I remember only ideas and sensations. Why? What happened in the name of God? You were making tea, Stephen said. And I went across the landing to get more hot water. Your mother and some visitor came out of the drawing room. She asked you who was in your room. Yes, Buck Mulligan said. What did I say? I, I forget. You said. Stephen answered. Oh, it's only Daedalus, whose mother is beastly dead. 
A flush which made him seem younger and more engaging rose to Buck Mulligan's cheek. Did I say that? He asked. Well, what harm is that? He shook his constraint from him nervously. And what is death? He asked. Your mother's, or yours, or my own. You saw only your mother die. I see them pop up every day in the martyr in Richmond and cut up into tripes in the dissecting room. It's a beastly thing and nothing else. It simply doesn't matter. You, you wouldn't kneel down to pray for your mother on her deathbed when she asked you. Why? Because you have the cursed Jesuit strain in you, only it's injected the wrong way. To me, it's all a mockery and beastly. Her cerebral lobes are not functioning. She calls the doctor Sir Peter Teasel and picks buttercups off the quilt. Humor her till it's over. You crossed her last wish in death, and yet you sulk with me because I don't whinge like some hired mute from Lalouette's. Absurd. I, I suppose I did say it. I didn't mean to offend the memory of your mother. He had spoken himself into boldness. Stephen, unshielding the gaping wounds which the words had left in his heart, said very coldly, I am not thinking of the offense to my mother. Of what then? Buck Mulligan asked. Of the offense to me. Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan swung round on his heel. Oh, an impossible person. He exclaimed. He walked off quickly round the parapet. Stephen stood at his post, gazing over the calm sea towards the headland. Sea and headland now grew dim. Pulses were beating in his eyes, failing their sight, and he felt the fever of his cheeks. A voice within the tower called loudly. Are you up there, Mulligan? I'm coming. Buck Mulligan answered. He turned towards Stephen and said, Look at the sea. What does it care about offenses? Chuck Loyola, Kench, and come on down. The Sassanac wants his morning rashers. His head halted again for a moment at the top of the staircase, level with the roof. Don't mope, mope over it all day, he, he said. said. I'm inconsequent. Give up the booty booty. His head vanished, but the drone of his descending voice boomed out of the stairhead. And no more, and no more turn aside and brood upon love's bitter mystery. The Fergus woods, the brazen cars. Wood shadows floated silently by through the morning peace from the stairhead seaward where he gazed. Inshore and farther out, the mirror of water whitened, spurned by light shod hurrying feet. White breast of the dim sea, the twining stresses two by two, a hand plucking the harp strings, merging their twining cords. Wave white wedded words, shimmering on the dim tide. A cloud began to cover the sun slowly, shadowing the bay in deeper green. It lay behind him, a bowl of bitter water. Say your names, please, for the benefit of our audience. Peggy Curran. John Benahu. Liam Phelan Cox. Anonymous. <laughs> Leopold Bloom is an ad canvasser for several Dublin newspapers. He's married to Madame Marion Tweedy, the opera singer, who is better known as Molly Bloom when she's at home. They have a 15-year-old daughter who is now in Mullingar, working as a photographer's assistant. 11 years ago, their only son, Rudy, died when he was 11 days old. This has caused a major strain on their marriage. It is eight o'clock in the morning and Leopold is in the kitchen at number seven, Eccles Street. He wants to make breakfast for himself when he is interrupted by the cat. Deciding that he would like a pork kidney he goes off to the butchers to buy one. Molly is still in bed when he gets back. The narrator for this section 
is Liam Phelan Cox. Leopold's outer voice is John Donahue. Molly is read by Colleen Curran. Bloom's interior monologue is read by Peggy Curran. Lugach the Butcher is read by Sylvia Simbolista. And because I speak fluent cat, I will read for the cat. <laughs> Okay. Mr. Leopold Bloom ate with relish the inner organs of beasts and owls. He liked thick giblet soup, nutty gizzards, a stuffed roast heart, liver slices fried with crust crumbs, fried hen cods rolls. Most of all, he liked grilled mutton kidneys which gave to his palate a fine tang of pastry sent to urine. Kidneys were in his mind as he moved about the kitchen softly, writing her breakfast things on the humpy tray. Jellied light and air were in the kitchen, but out of doors, gentle summer morning everywhere. Made him feel a bit peckish. The coals were reddening. Another slice of bread and butter. Three, four, right. She didn't like her plate full, right. He turned from the tray, lifted the kettle off the hob and set it sideways on the fire. It sat there dull and squat, its spout stuck out. Cup of tea soon, good, mouth dry. The cat walked stiffly round the leg of the table with tail on high. <coughs> Oh, there you are, Mr. Bloom said, turning from the fire. The cat mewed in answer and stopped again stiffly round the leg of the table, mewing. Just how she stalks over my writing table, purr, scratch my head, purr. Mr. Bloom watched curiously, kindly, the live black form. Clean to see the gloss of her sleek hide, the white button under the bottom of her tail, the green flashing eyes. He bent down to her, his hands on his knees. Milk for the pussins, he said. The cat cried. They call them stupid. They understand what we say better than we understand them. She understands all she wants to. Vindictive, too. Cruel. Her nature. Curious mice never steal. Seem to like it. Wonder what I look like to her. Head of the tower? No, she can jump me. Afraid of the chickens she is. He said mockingly. Afraid of the chook chooks. I never saw such a stupid pussins as the pussins. Oh, ah! The cat said loudly. <laughs> she blinked up out of her avid shame closing eyes mewing plaintively and long, showing him her milk-white teeth. He watched the dark eye slits narrowing with greed till her eyes were green stones. Then he went to the dresser, took the jug Hanlon's milkman had just filled for him, poured warm bubbled milk on a saucer and set it slowly on the floor. She cried, running to laugh. He watched the bristles shining wirily in the weak light as she ticked three times and licked lightly. Wonder, is it true if you clip them they can't mouse after? Why? They shine in the dark, perhaps, for kids. Or kind of feelers in the dark, perhaps. On the doorstep, he felt in his hip pocket for the latch key. Not there. In the trousers I left off? Must get it. 
Potato I have, creaky wardrobe. No use disturbing her. She turned over sleepily that time. He pulled the whole door to after him very quietly, more till the foot leaf dropped gently over the threshold, the limp lid. Looked shut. All right till I come back in half. He crossed to the bright side, avoiding the loose cellar flap of number 75. The sun was nearing the steeple on George's church. Be a warm day, I fancy. Especially in these dark clothes. Feel it more. Black and guts. Reflex. Reflex, is it? The heat. But I couldn't go in that light suit. Make a picnic of it. His eyelids sank quietly often as he walked in happy warmth. Boland's bread van delivering the trays are daily, but she prefers yesterday's loaves. Turnovers, crisp, crowned, hot. Makes you feel young. He halted before Dugach's window, staring at the hanks of sausages, alonies, black and white. Fifteen multiplied by. The figures whitened in his mind, unsolved. Displeased, he let them fade. The shiny links packed with force meat fed his gaze, and, and he breathed in tranquilly the lukewarm breath of cooked spicy pig's blood. Mr. Bloom pointed quickly. To catch up and walk behind her, if she went slowly, behind her moving hands. Pleasant to see first thing in the morning. Hurry up, damn it. Make hay while the sun shines. She stood outside the shop in sunlight and sauntered lazily to the right. He sighed down his nose. He never understands. Soda chapped hands, crusted toenails too. Brown scapulars in tatters, defending her both ways. The sting of disregard glowed to weak pleasure within his breast. For another, a constable off duty, cuddling her in echoes lane. They like them sizable, prime sausage. Oh, please, Mr. Policeman, I'm lost in the wood. Three pence, please. Thank you, sir, another time. Two letters and a card lay on the hall floor. He stooped and gathered them. This is Marilyn Bloom. His quickened heart slowed at once. Bold hand, Mrs. Marilyn. Pauly! Entering the bedroom, he half closed his eyes and walked through warm yellow twilight towards her tousled head. Who are the letters for? He looked at them. Mullingar, Millie. Uh, a letter for me from Millie. He said carefully. And the card to you, and a letter for you. He laid her card and letter on the twill bedspread near the curve of her knees. Do you want the blind up? Letting the blind up by gentle tugs halfway, his backward eye saw her glance at the letter and tuck it under her pillow. That do? He asked, turning. She was reading the card, propped on her elbow. She got the things, she said. He waited till she had laid the card aside and curled herself back slowly with a snug sigh. Hurry up with that tea, she said. I'm parched. The kettle's boiling, he said. Scald the teapot. On the boil, sure enough, a plume of steam from the spout. He scalded and rinsed out the teapot and put in four full spoons of tea, tilting the kettle then to let the water flow in. Having set it to draw, he took off the kettle, crushed the pan flat on the live coals, and watched the lump of butter slide and melt. When he unwrapped a kidney, the cat mewed hungrily against him. Give her too much meat, she won't mouse. Say they don't like pork. Kosher, here. He let the blood-smeared paper fall to her and dropped the kidney amid the sizzling butter sauce. Yeah. He sprinkled it to his fingers ringwise from the chipped egg cup. The tea was drawn. He filled his own mustache cup. Sham crown derby, smiling. Silly Millie's birthday gift. Only five she was then. No wink. Four. I gave her the amboid necklace she broke. Putting a piece of folded brown paper in the letterbox for her. Oh, Millie Bloom, you are my darling. 
You are my looking glass from night to morning. I'd rather have you without a farthing than Katie Keogh with her ass and garden. He plodded a fork into the kidney and slapped it over, then fitted the teapot on the tray. Its hump bumped as he took it up. Everything on it, bread and butter, four, sugar, spoon, or cream. He carried it upstairs, his thumb hooked in the teapot handle. Nudging the door open with his knee, he carried the tray in and set it on the chair by the bedhead. What a time you were, she said. She doubled a slice of bread into her mouth, asking, What time is the funeral? Eleven, I think, he answered. I didn't see the paper. There's a smell of burn, she said. Did you leave anything on the fire? The kidney, he cried suddenly. Peggy Curran. And uh, John Donahue. Colleen Curran. Liam Phelan Cox. The cat. <laughs> the cat. The cat. In the meantime, while all of this has been going on over on Eccle Street, Stephen has left the tower. He's gone to the school for the sons of the upper crust where he teaches. He gets paid at the same time as he gets a lecture from Dominie DC about thrift and erroneous history. He then goes for a walk on the beach at Sandy Mount Strand, thinking about different philosophers and their philosophies, all the while identifying himself with Hamlet. Back in Leopold Bloom's world, it is 10 a.m. He's on the way to the Westland Row post office. Molly had earlier received a letter from Blaze's Boylan, her concert manager, saying to expect him at 4 p.m. They're going to put the finishing touches on the concert tour program. Or is it for him to put his touch on her? Leopold is on his way to collect a letter from his clandestine epistolary love interest. Under the name of Henry Flower, he retrieves the letter and surreptitiously reads it. Leopold also visits the chemist, Sweeney, to buy some lotion for Molly and a bar of lemon soap. Indoor plumbing being a rare commodity in those days, he heads to the public bath before attending a funeral. The narrator for this section is Pat Machen. Leopold Bloom's inner voice will be read by Colleen Curran. Bloom's outer voice, Peggy Curran, McCoy, Sylvia Symbolista, Martha's Letter will be read by Susan Gilmore. I played the cat, now I play the chemist. Okay. By Laurie, so long Sir Roger Johnson's key. Mr. Bloom walked soberly past Windmill Lane, leaps the linseed after the postal office. Could have given that address too. And past the sailor's home. He turned from the morning noises of the quayside and walked through Lime Street. By Brady's cottage, a boy from the skin's law, his bucket of awful linked, smoking a chewed fag butt. A smaller girl with scars of eczema on her forehead eyed him listlessly holding her battered cask boot. Tell him if he smokes, he won't grow. Oh, let him. His life isn't such a bed of roses. Waiting outside pubs to bring Da home. Come home to Ma, Da. Slack hour. Won't be many there. He crossed Townsend Street past the frowning face of metal. El, yes, house of 
Aleph Beth. And past Nichols, the undertaker. At 11 it is, time enough. Dare say Corny Keelaher bagged the job for O'Neill's, singing with his eyes shut. Corny, met her once in the park, in the dark. What a lark. Police toot. Her name and address, she then told with my tour allure 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 tay. Oh yes, surely she bagged it. Bury him chief in a whatchamacallit. With my tour allure, tour allure, tour allure, tour allure. From the curbstone, he darted a keen glass through the door of the post office. Too late box, post here, no one. He handed the car through the brass room. Are there any letters for me? He asked. While the postmistress searched a pigeonhole, he gazed at the recruiting poster with soldiers of all arms on parade and held the tip of his baton against his nostrils, smelling fresh printed rag paper. Uh, no answer, probably. Went too far last time. Postmistress handed him back through the field his card with a letter. He thanked her and glanced rapidly at the typed envelope. Henry Flower Esquire, care of Post Office, Westland Road, City. Answered anyhow. He slipped the card and letter into his side pocket, reviewing again the soldiers on parade. Where's old Tweedy's regiment? Cast off soldier. There, bearskin cap and hackle of plume. No, he's a grenadier. Pointed cuffs. Ah, there. There he is, Royal Dublin Fusiliers, red coats, ah, too showy. That must be why the women go after them, the uniform, easier to enlist and drill. Maud Gunn's letter about taking them off O'Connell Street at night, disgrace to our Irish capital. Griffith's paper is on the same tack now, an army rotten with venereal disease, overseas or half sea over empire. Half baked, they looked. Hypnotized like eyes front, mark time, table able. Bed, Ed, the king's own. Never seen him dressed up as a fireman or a bobby. A mason, yes. He strolled out of the post office and turned on the right. Talk, as if that would mend matters. His hand went into his pocket and his fourth finger felt its way <laughs> under the flap of the envelope, ripping it open in jerks. Women would pay a lot of heed, I don't think. His fingers drew forth the letter and crumpled the envelope in his pockets. Something pinned on. on. Photo, perhaps? Hair? No. McCoy, get rid of him quickly. Take me out of my way. Hate company, when you? Hello, Blue. Where are you off to? Hello, McCoy. Nowhere in particular. How's the body? Fine. How are you? Just keeping alive, McCoy said. His eyes on the black time clothes. He asked with so low. Oh, respect. Is there any oh, trouble? I hope I see your. Oh, no, Mr. Bloom said. Poor Dingham, you know, the funeral is today. Would you be sure for sure? A photo, it isn't. A badge, maybe. Eleven. Mr. Bloom answered. I must try to get out. Eleven, is it? I only heard it last night. I was telling Holahan. You know, Hawking. I know. Why, friend, I suppose. McCoy's changed for said. Oh, yes. Tip top, thanks. He unrolled the envelope, baton, idly, and read idly. What is home without plum trees, potted meat? Incomplete. With it an abode of bliss. My missus has just got an engagement. At least it's not seven yet. Police tack again, by the way, no harm. I'm off that, thanks. Mr. Bloom turned his large, lidded eyes with on HT friendliness. My wife too, he said. She's going to sing at a swagger affair in the Ulster Hall, Belfast, on the 25th. That's so, McCoy said. Glad to hear that, old man. Who's getting it up? Mrs. Marion Bloom, not up yet. Queen was in her bedroom eating bread and, ah, oh, no book. Blackened court cards laid along her thigh by sevens. Dark lady and fair man. Letter. Cat furry black ball. Torn strip of envelope. Love's old sweet song. Comes love's old. 
It's kind of a tour, don't you, don't you see? Mr. Bloom said thoughtfully. Sweet song. There's a committee formed, part shares and part profits. McCoy nodded, picking at his mustache double. All right, he said. That's good news. He moved to go. Well, glad to see looking in fit, he said, meeting up and around. Yes, Mr. Bloom said. Tell me what, McCoy said. You might put my name down at the funeral, will you? I'd like to do, but I might be able to see. There's a drowning case at Sandy Cove might turn up and then the coroner myself would have to go down if the body's found. But just shove in my name if I'm not there, will you? I'll do that, Mr. Gluten said, moving to get off. That'll be all right. Right, Mr. McCoy said brightly. Thanks, old man. I'll go if I possibly could. Well, come on. Just see Pima McCoy would do. He drew the letter from his pocket and folded in the newspaper he carried. Might just walk into her here. The lane is safer. He passed the cabin's shelter. Curious the life of drifting cabbies. All weathers, all places. Time or set down. No will of their own. Volio inon. Like to give them an odd cigarette. Sociable. Shout a few flying syllables as they pass. La ci darem la mano. La 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 la. He turned into Cumberland Street and, going on some paces, halted at the lee of the station wall. No one needs timber yard, piled bulks, ruins and tenements. With careful tread, he passed over a hot scotch court with its forgotten picky stone. Not a sinner. Near the timber yard, a squatted child at marbles, alone shooting the taw with cunning thumb. A wise tabby, a blinking sphinx, watch from her warm silk. Pity to disturb them. Mohammed cut a piece out of his mantle not to wake her. Open it. And once I played marbles, when I went to that old dame's school, she liked mignonette. Mrs. Ellie's and Mr. He opened the letter within the newsletter. A flower, I think it is. A, a yellow flower with flattened petals. Not annoyed then. What does she say? Dear Henry, I got your last letter to me and thank you very much for it. I am sorry you did not like my last letter. Why did you enclose the stamps? I am awfully angry with you. I do wish I could punish you for that. I Oh, you naughty boy, because I do not like that other world. Please tell me, what is the real meaning of that world? Are you not happy in your home, you poor little naughty boy? I do wish I could do something for you. Please tell me what you think of poor me. I often think of the beautiful name you have. Dear Henry, when will we meet? I think of you so often, you have no idea. I have never felt myself so much drawn to a man as you. I feel so bad about it. Please, write me a long letter and tell me more. Remember, if you do not, I will punish you. So now you know what I will do to you, you naughty boy, if you do not write. Oh, how I long to meet you. Henry, dear, do not deny my request before my patients are exhausted. Then I will tell you all. Goodbye now, naughty darling. I had such a bad headache today and write by return to your longing, Martha. Yes, do tell me what kind of perfume does your wife use? I want to know. He tore the flower gravely from its pinhole, smelt its almost no smell, and placed it in his heart pocket. Language of flowers. They like it because no one can hear, or a poison bouquet to strike him down. Then walking slowly forward, he read the letter again, murmuring here and there a word. Angry tulips with you, darling man flower. Punish your cactus if you don't please pour forget-me-not. How I long violets to dear roses when we should soon anime meet all naughty nightstock wife Martha's perfume. 
Having read it all, he took it from the newspaper and put it back in his, his side pocket. Weak jaw opened his lips. Changed since the first letter. Wonder why did she write it herself? Doing the indignant, a girl of good family like me, respectable character, could meet one Sunday after the rosary. Thank you for not having any usual love scrimmage, then running round corners, bad as a row with Molly. Cigar has a cooling effect, narcotic. Go further next time, naughty boy. Punish, afraid of words, of course. Brutal, why not? Try it anyhow, a bit at a time. Fingering still a letter in his pocket, he drew the pin out of it. Common pin, eh? He threw it on the road. Out of her clothes somewhere, pinned together. Queer the number of pins they always had. No roses without thorns. He walked southward along Westland Road. But the recipe's in the other trousers. Oh, and I forgot that latchkey too. Bore this funeral affair. Oh, well, poor fellow. It's not his fault. When was it I got it made up last? Wait. I changed the sovereign, I remember. First of the month, it must have been, or the second. Oh, he can look it up in the prescriptions book. The chemist turned back page after page. Sandy shriveled smell he seems to have, shrunken skull, an old quest for the philosopher's stone, the alchemist, drugs age after mental excitement, lethargy then, why, reaction, a lifetime in a night, gradually treatments, disinfectants, all his alabaster lily pots, mortar and pestle, ach, dist, fall, lore, tevated. Smell almost cure like the dentist's doorbell. Dr. Whack, he ought to physic himself a bit. Electric or emulsion. The first fellow that picked that herb to cure himself had a bit of pluck. Electric. Mm. Simples, want to be careful. Enough stuff here to chloroform you. Test, turns blue litmus paper red. Chloroform, overdose of laudanum. Sleeping drugs, love filters. Paragormic poppy syrup, bad for cough. Clogs the pores or the phlegm. Poison's the only cures. Remedy when you least expect it. Clever of nature. About a fortnight ago, sir? Yes, Mr. Bloom said. He waited by the counter, inhaling slowly the keen reek of drugs. The dusty, dry smell of sponges and loofahs. Lots of time taken up telling your aches and pains. Sweet almond oil and tincture of benzoin, Mr. Bloom said, and then orange flower water. It certainly did make her skin so delicate, white like wax. And white wax also, he said. Brings out the darkness of her eyes, looking at me, the sheet up to her eyes. Spanish, smelling herself. When I was fixing the links in my cuffs, those homely recipes are often the best. Strawberries for the teeth, nettles and rainwater. Oatmeal, they say, steeped in buttermilk. Skin food. One of the old queen's sons, Duke of Albany, was it? Had only one skin. Leopold, yes. Three we have, warts, bunions, and pimples to make it worse. But you want a perfume too. What perfume does your podis bang? That orange flower water is so fresh. Nice smell these soaps have. Pure curd soap. Time to get a bath round the corner. Haman, Turkish massage. Dirt gets rolled up in your navel. Nice if her girl did it. Also, I think I, yes, I do it in the bath. Curious longing. Water to water. Combine business with pleasure. Pity no time for massage. Feel fresh then all the day. Funeral will be rather glum. Yes, sir. The chemist said. That was two and nine. Have you brought a bottle? No, Mr. Bloom said. Make it up, please. I'll call later in the day and I'll take one of these soaps. How much are they? Fourpence, sir. Mr. Bloom raised a cake to his nostril. Sweet lemony wax. I'll take this one, he said. That makes three and a penny. Enjoy a bath now. Clean trough of water, cool enamel, the gentle tepid stream. This is my body. Peggy Curran. 
Colleen Curran. Pat Machen. The chemist. Okay, we've come to the last reading this morning before we have our lunch break. At 11 a.m., Leopold joins the group going to the burial of Patty Dignan at Prospect Cemetery in Glasnevin, north of Dublin. The cortege travels through the streets of Dublin to Dignam's last resting place. Leopold's family was originally Jewish. They converted to Protestantism and he converted to Catholicism to marry Molly. Having no formal religious education or upbringing, he is woefully uninformed about what he sees. The narrator for this episode is John Donahue. Power is Sylvia Symbolista. Simon Dedalus, <clears throat> Pat Machen. Cunningham is Peggy Curran. The priest will be me. Leopold Bloom, inner voice and outer voice, will be Liam Phelan Cox. Eight. Martin Cunningham first poked his silk-hatted head into the creaking carriage and entering deftly seated himself. Mr. Power stepped in after him, curving his height with care. Come on, Simon. After you, Mr. Bloom said. Mr. Dedalus covered himself quickly and got in saying. Yes, yes. Are we all here now? Martin Cunningham asked. Come along, Bloom. Mr. Bloom entered and sat in the vacant place. He pulled the door to after him and slammed it tight till it shut tight. He passed an arm through the arm strap and looked seriously from the open carriage window at the lowered blinds on the avenue. One dragged aside, an old woman peeping, nose quite flattened against the pane. Thanking her star. She was passed over. Extraordinary the interest they take in the courts. Glad to see us go. We give them such trouble coming. Job seems to suit them. Mugger mugger in corners. Slop about in slipper slappers for fear he'd wake. Then getting it ready. Laying it out. Molly and Mrs. Fleming making the bed. Put it more to your side. Our winding sheet. Never know who will touch you, dead. Wash and shampoo. I believe they clip the nails and the hair. Keep a bit in an envelope. Go the same after. Unclean job. All waited. Nothing was said. Stowing in the reeds, probably. I'm sitting on something hard. Oh, that soap in my hip pocket. I better shift it out of that. Wait for an opportunity. All waited, then wheels were heard from in front, turning, then nearer, then horses' hoofs. A jolt, the carriage began to move, creaking and swaying. Other hoofs and creaking wheels started behind. The blinds of the mm -hmm. avenue passed, and number nine with its crepe knocker door ajar. At walking pace, they waited still, their knees jogging, till they had turned and were passing along the tram tracks. Triton Bill Gold, quicker. The wheels rattled rolling over the cobbled causeway and the crazy glasses shook rattling in the door frames. What can you see taking us? Mr. Power asked through both windows. Irish town. M Martin Cunningham said. Rings in. Street. Mr. Dedalus nodded looking out. Mm, that's a fine old custom. He said. I'm glad to see it has not died out. All watched a while through their window caps and hats lifted by passes. Respect. The carriage swerved from the tram track to the smoother road, past Watery Lane. 
Mr. Bloom at day saw a live young man clad in mourning, a white hat. There's a friend of yours gone, Diggles. Who's He's that? Your son in the air. Where is he? Mr. Dedalus said, stretching over across. The carriage passing the open drains and mounds of ripped up roadway before the tenement houses lurched round the corner and swerving back to the tram track rolled on noisily with chattering wheels. Mr. Dedalus fell back saying, Was that mulligan cad with him? His fetus a cat ate? No, Mr. Bloom said. He was alone. Mr. Bloom put his head out the window. The Grand Canal, he, he said. said. Gasworks, whooping cough, they say it cures. Good job Milly never got it. Poor children, doubles them up black and blue in convulsions. Shame, really. Not off lightly with illness compared, only measles. Flaxseed tea, scarlatina, influenza epidemics. Canvassing for death, don't miss this chance. Dogs home over there. Poor old Athos, be good to Athos, Leopold, is my last wish. Thy will be done, we obey them in the grave, the dying scrawl. She took it to heart, pined away, quiet brute. Old men's dogs usually are. A raindrop spat on his hat. He drew back and saw an instant of shower spray dots over the grey flags. Apart. Curious, like to a colander. I thought it would. My, my boots were creaking. Rem I remember now. The weather is changing, he said quietly. The deed did not keep up fine, Martin Cunningham said. Wanted for the country, Mr. Power said. Here's the sun again coming out. Mr. Dedalus, peering through his glasses towards the veiled sun, hurled a mute curse at the sky. <laughs> it's as uncertain as a child's bottom, <laughs> he said. We're off again. The carriage turned again, its stiff wheels and their trunks swayed gently. Martin Cunningham twirled more quickly the peak of his beard. Tom Kiernan was immense last night, he said. And Paddy Leonard taking him off on his face. Oh, Troy and Mount Marchant. Mr. Power said eagerly. Wait till you hear him, signing on bed in dollar singing of the crown boy. Immense. Martin Cunningham said pompously. The singing of that single ballad, Martin, is the most trenchant rendering I ever heard in the whole course of my experience. Trenchant. Mr. Power said, laughing. He said, that's on that, and the retrospective arrangement. They went past the bleak pulpit of St. Mark's under the railway bridge, past the Queen's Theatre in silence. Hoardings. Eugene Stratton, Mrs. Bandman Palmer. Could I go to see Leah tonight, I wonder? I said I. Or the Lily of Killarney. Elster Graham's Opera Company. Big powerful change. Wet bright bills for next week. Turn on the Bristol. Martin Cunningham could work a pass for the gaiety. Have to stand a drink or two. As broad as it's long. He's coming in the afternoon. Her songs. Plastos, Sir Philip Crampton's memorial fountain bust. Who was he? How do you do? Martin Cunningham said, raising his palms to his brow in salute. He doesn't see us. Mr. Power said. Oh, yes, he does. How do you do? Oh. Mr. Dedalus asked. This is good. Mr. Power said. There he is, Aaron is quit. Just that moment I was thinking. Mr. Dedalus bent across to salute. From the door of the red bank of the white disc of a straw hat flashed reply. Passed. Mr. Bloom reviewed the nails on his, of his left hand, then those of his right. The nails, mm, yes. Uh, is there anything more in him that they see that... Is there anything more in him that they she sees? Oops. Fascination. Worst man in Dublin, that keeps him alive. They sometimes feel what a person is. Instinct. But a type like that. My nails. And just looking at them, well paired. And after, thinking alone. Body getting a bit softy. I would notice that from remembering. 
What causes that? I suppose the skin can't contract quickly enough when the flesh falls off. But the shape is there. The shape is there still. Shoulders, hips, plump. Night of the dance dressing. Shift stuck between the cheeks behind. He clasped his hands between his knees and satisfied, sent his vacant glance over the faces. Mr. Power asked, was the concert you were getting on, Bloom? Oh, very well. I heard great accounts of it. It's a good idea, you see. Are you going yourself? Well, no, Mr. Bloom said. In point of fact, I have to go down to the County Clare on some private business. You see, the idea is to tour the chief towns. What you lose on one, you can make up on the other. So, Martin Cunningham said. Mary Anderson is up there now. Have you good artists? Lewis Werner is touring her. Mr. Bloom said. Oh, yes, we'll have all top numbers. J.C. Doyle and John McCormick, I hope, and the best, in fact. And Madam. Mr. Power said, smiling. Last but not least. The carriage rattled swiftly along Blessington Street. Over the stones. We're going apace, I think. Martin Cunningham said. God grant she doesn't upset us on the road. Mr. Power said. I hope not. Martin Cunningham said. That will be a great race tomorrow in Germany. The Gordon Bennett. Yes, by Joe. Mr. Dedalus said. That will be worth seeing, Faith. As they turned into Berkeley Street, a, steer, a street organ near the basin sent over and after them a rollicking, rattling song of the halls. Has anyone here seen Kelly? K A double L Y. <laughs> Dead March from Saul. He's as bad as old Antonio. He left me on my own. <laughs> Pirouette. The Martyr Misericordiae, Echo Street. My house down there, big place. Water and curables there, very encouraging. Our Lady's Hospice for the Dying. Dead house, handy underneath, where old Mrs. Reardon died. Oh, they look terrible, the women. Her feeding cup and rubbing her mouth with the spoon. And then the screen round her bed for her to die. Huh? Nice young student that was dressed that Nice young student that was, dressed that bite the bee gave me. He's gone over to the lying in hospital, they told me, from one extreme to the other. The mutes shouldered the coffin and bored through the gates. So much dead weight. Felt heavier myself stepping out of that bar. First the stiff, then the friends of the stiff. Corny Kelleher and the boy followed with their wreaths. Who's that beside them? Ah, uh, the brother-in-law. All walked after. They halted about the door of the mortuary chapel. Mr. Bloom stood behind the boy with the wreath, looking down at his sleek combed hair and the slender furrowed neck inside his brand new collar. Poor boy. Was he there when the father, uh, both unconscious, lighting up at the last moment and recognized for the last time? <laughs> All he might have done. I owe three shillings to O'Grady. Would he understand? The mutes bore the coffin into the chapel. Which end is his head? After a moment, he followed the others in, blinking in the screen light. The coffin lay on its bier before the chancel, four tall yellow candles at its corners. Always in front of us, Coyne Kelleher, laying a wreath at each four corner, beckoned to the boy to kneel. The mourners knelt here and there in praying desks. Mr. Bloom stood behind near the front, the, sorry, near the font. And when they had knelt, dropped carefully his unfolded newspaper from his pocket and knelt his right knee upon it. He fitted his black hat gently on his left knee and holding its brim, bent over piously. A server bearing a brass bucket with something in it came out through a door. The white smocked priest came after him, tidying his stall with one hand, balancing with the other a little book against his toady belly, his toad's belly. Who'll read the book? 
I said the book. They halted by the beer and the priest began to read out of his book with a fluent croak. Oh, coffee. I knew his name was like a coffin. Dominy Namini. Bully about the muzzle, he looks. Bosses the show. Muscular Christian. Well, beside anyone that looks crooked at him, priest, thou art Peter. <laughs> First sideways like a sheep in clover, Daedalus says he will, with a belly on him like a poisoned pup. Most amusing expressions that man finds. Eh? <laughs> First sideways. Non entras in judicium cum servo tuo domine. Makes them feel more important to be prayed over in Latin. Requiem mass, crepe weepers, black edge no paper, your name on the altar list. Oh, chilly place this. Want to feed well, sitting in there all the morning in the gloom, click kicking his heels, waiting for the next, please. Eyes of a toad, too. What swells him up that way? Molly gets swelled after cabbage. Air of the place, maybe. Looks full up of bad gas. Must be an infernal lot of bad gas round the place, eh? Butchers, for instance, they get like raw beefsteaks. Who will telling me. Mervyn Brown, down in the vaults of St. Werberg's lovely old organ, 150, they have to bore a hole in the coffin sometimes to let out the bad gas and burn it. Out it rushes, blue. One whiff of that and you're a goner. Oh, my kneecap is hurting me. Oh, well, that's better. The priest took a stick with a knob at the end of it out of the boy's bucket and shook it over the coffin. Then he walked to the other end and shook it again. Then he came back and put it back in the bucket. As you were before you rested. It's all written down. He has to do it. Et ne nos inducas in The server piped the answers in the treble. I often thought it would be better to have boy servants, up to 15 or so. After that, of course. Holy water that was, I expect. Shaking sleep out of it. You must be fed up with that job, shaking that thing all over the corpse as they trot up. What harm if he could see what he was shaking it over? Every mortal day, a fresh batch. Middle-aged men, old women, children, women dead in childbirth, men with beards, bald-headed bald businessmen, consumptive girls with little sparrows' breasts. All the year round she prayed the same thing over them all and shook water on top of them. Sleep, undignum now. In paradiso. Said he was going to paradise or, or is in paradise. Says that over everybody. Tyson kind of a job, but he has to say something. The priest closed his book and went off, followed by the server. Corny Kelleher opened the side doors and the grave diggers came in, hoisted the coffin again, carried it out and shoveled it on, sorry, and shoved it on their cart. Corny Kelleher gave one wreath to the boy, one to the brother-in-law. All followed them out of the side doors into the mild gray air. Mr. Bloom came last, folding his paper again into his pocket. He gazed gravely at the ground till the coffin cart wheeled off to the left. The metal wheels ground the gravel with a sharp grating cry, and the pack of blunt boots followed the barrow along a lane of sepulchers. The bee, the ra, the fee, the ra, the woo. Oh, Lord, I mustn't lilt here. Would you introduce yourself again, please? Peggy Fern, Sylvia Sudamus, Pat Major, John Benahur, still Liam Palin Cox, the priest. <laughs> As 
promised after Hades, we are going to take a break for lunch. Please be back for 1.35 this afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. I hope to see you again later this afternoon. My Lord. What's happening? What's happening?